Hello and welcome to your online lecture for the thorax and abdomen. Today we're going to be discussing the anatomy of the thorax and the abdominal cavity and then also common pathologies that you'll see in the clinical setting. Of course, I am Dr. Cosby and we will first start with anatomy of the thorax. So the first image that you'll see here is an image of the actual thorax, particularly the anterior aspect of the thorax. And so let's go through a quick review of, of the anatomy. So first, anteriorly, we have this green structure here, which is known as the sternum as a whole. That sternum is broken up into three parts. Part one is the manubrium. Part two is the sternal body, usually the largest part of the sternum. And then we have the xiphoid process. You might know the xiphoid process if you are CPR certified. It is the area of the sternum that we recommend not compressing on. Um, in fact, moving into the center of the sternum to do that because it is, as you can see, spear shaped. So when it punctures posteriorly, it will probably puncture a portion of the heart. So again, if you are CPR certified, make sure you're kind of doing your chest compressions or performing your chest compressions above the xiphoid process. But the three bony anatomical structures make up as a whole what we call the most anterior portion of the thorax, which is the sternum. Within the manubrial body, we have this kind of um, indent, um, and this is called the, the jugular notch, right? And you might notice the clavicle, and we'll talk about the clavicle a lot in the upper extremity. But the reason we have it here, or at least show it here, is because the most medial portion of the clavicle does articulate with the thorax. In particular, it articulates with the sternum. Um, so we have a joint called the sternoclavicular joint, and so it represents that joint right here. So that's why we're seeing the clavicle. Next on the most anterior aspect of the thorax, we also have the ribs. And so we have uh, 12 distinct sets of ribs on the right and left side of our body. Seven of those ribs are what we are call our true ribs, which means they have a direct attachment to the actual sternum itself. Eight ribs, eight through 10, um, on the other hand, are called false ribs because they don't have a direct attachment to the sternum, but indirectly through ribs seven and six, they do attach to the sternum. So they're called false ribs. And then ribs 11 through 12 are floating ribs. And so what that means is they have a posterior attachment to the spine, like their other 10 counterparts, but they don't have an, a, an attachment to the anterior aspect of the thorax at all, right? All ribs, if we were to turn or rotate this image, would have a posterior attachment to its respective vertebral body. So rib one with vertebral body number one, rib two with vertebral body number two, so forth and so on. There are 12 thoracic vertebrae, just in case you did not know. I believe you do, but just in case you don't, there are 12 thoracic vertebrae, 12 ribs. Again, seven are true, which means they directly attach to the sternum. 8 through 10 are false, which means they indirectly attach to the sternum via um, uh, ribs 6 and 7 cartilage. And then ribs 11 through 12 are called floating because they don't have a direct, they don't have an attachment to the anterior sternum at all, right? So this, why is the thorax so important? That's usually the question that I would want to know if I were sitting in a class learning about the anatomy, the bony anatomy. The major role of the thorax is obviously protective in nature. It is going to protect the heart anteriorly, right? So that's one role. The other role is the thorax in general. I'm going to skip to this slide. The thorax in general plays a major role um, and is a major anchor site for many of the muscles that um, control motion at the glenohumeral joint or shoulder, elbow, wrist, and hand. It's also an anchor, anchor point for neck muscles. And if they, we were to flip this image, it would also be a major anchoring point for a lot of the back muscles. So you can see it's an anchoring point. You can see that it also provides a lot of the protection to the heart, but then not only the heart, the vessels that supply the heart and the, the lungs as well. So that thorax, the thorax both, an, both anteriorly and posteriorly play a major role in, in protecting, right? A lot of our major organs. As we move back to this image, ribs 11 through 12, they're floating, right? Which means they don't attach to the anterior sternum. But the reason we have ribs 11 and 12 is because posteriorly we have two internal organs uh, known as the kidneys that sit relatively low. And so the major role of uh, the floating ribs is really to uh, protectionary in nature, to protect those kidneys as they sit relatively low 
um, and the posterior aspect of our abdominal cavity. So I'm going to keep going here and we're going to move into kind of ad abdominal anatomy. I, I, it would be remiss of me not to say that even though the abdominal cavity and the thoracic cavity are distinct cavities, the two are kind of interwoven or interlinked, right? In, in the ways that we think about their connections. So it, as an example, um, this is a thoracic cavity, right? And um, just underneath the thoracic cavity, one of the things that we can't see in this image is the diaphragm, right? And the diaphragm, we could imagine we could draw it in there. Oh, I guess we can. We can see it right here. The diaphragm, as we can see, it's kind of the connecting piece between the abdominal cavity and the thoracic cavity. And we'll talk about the diaphragm in just a second, but let's, let's dissect this abdominal cavity, right? The abdominal cavity houses all of our internal organs. So in the upper right-hand quadrant, we have the large, very large liver. In the upper left-hand quadrant, we're going to have the spleen. In that lower left-hand quadrant, we have the descending colon um, and some of the small intestines. And then in the right lower quadrant, we have the appendix, which really isn't pictured here, but we well, we have the appendix. And so um, those are the four kind of major internal organs. I've already mentioned the kidneys, which will sit more posterior and be protected by those floating ribs. But if we go back to this slide and we look at all of the muscles right, which anchor to the thorax and or abdominal cavity. Well, we can really say is that we're thankful for that, right? Because not only does the thorax protect the heart, not only does the thorax protect the lungs, um, but the thorax and abdominal cavity in general, its muscles, its viscera, they're all responsible for protecting, yes, those things that I've mentioned, but also the internal organs, in particular, the abdominal muscles, right? The lats or the rectus abdominis, the transverse abdominis, for example, or those obliques, they're majorly responsible for kind of keeping all of those internal organs in their space, right? But then also absorbing a lot of the shock or blows that might occur to the abdominal cavity so that our internal organs don't have to withstand those blows. So we have those internal organs here. And again, we can see how the abdominal region or the abdominal muscles in particular really kind of create a corset, right? A place for or a tight like anatomical structure, which will then hold those internal organs in place. So any compromise or any injury to the rectus abdominis or any of the other muscles that wrap around the internal organs. And what we start to see is maybe um, compromise to the internal organs or less shock being absorbed by those muscles and being transferred to our internal organs. And so we're thankful for that, right? We're thankful for those abdominal muscles where we really um, appreciate the role of the thorax and what it actually does for, for our patients and for our bodies in particular. And so as we look at this, I said the one thing that was missing that wasn't really drawn in um, was with the diaphragm, right? And so we can see the diaphragm here, and this is a beautiful image, right? Like I said, the, di the diaphragm kind of separates thorax from the abdominal region. This is the diaphragm. It's a muscle. It's the muscle of respiration. Um, and so imagine this. When we inhale, go ahead and do that with me. So when we inhale, that diaphragm is going to contract. And when we get diaphragmatic contraction, that secondarily will lead to the lead the thorax to expand, right? And that allows our lungs to fill with air. And so we're allowed to bring in O2, right? And as we exhale, go ahead and exhale. That diaphragm then relaxes, the thorax goes back to its resting position, and we're able to remove any CO2 or any other types of things that we want to remove from the human body. So any dysfunction to the diaphragm, like a hypercontraction, and we really struggle to catch our breath. We really struggle to, to breathe, right? So that diaphragm um, is important because, like I just said, it separates the abdominal cavity from the thoracic cavity, but it's a major kind of muscle in respiration. Um, it's what's responsible for helping or initiating the thorax to expand or initiating the thorax to, to relax, right? And then last, but definitely not least, as we enter into uh, contact sports or patients who are at high risk for taking blows to the abdominal cavities, um, we have learned over time that there is a way to systematically palpate each of the internal organs within the abdominal cavity. And there are two different approaches. Um, you have the gastric, re gastric region approach or the quadrant approach. So, I mean, you can kind of choose which one works best for you. Most of us in the field of AT um, and coaching uh, lean towards the quadrant approach. It's quick. It allows for a very quick sideline assessment. 
the um, abdominal pelvic regions or gastric region approach is going to be more thorough and t is going to take more time, which if you're not on the sidelines trying to determine return to play quickly, then this is probably the more thorough approach and the approach that will allow you to really determine which internal organ might be compromised. But if we take quadrant approach, we have a right upper quadrant where the, most of the liver is going to live, not all, right? We're going to have the spleen in the upper left-hand quadrant. In the lower left quadrant, we're going to mainly be assessing um, intestines maybe and, and uh, descending colon for sure. And in that right lower quadrant, remember we talked about the appendix, right? So it's a quick sweep. You're going to be palpating that. And maybe we'll do that in class if you all are comfortable with it. If not, maybe we can practice on some type of mannequin. But if we take an abdominal pelvic or a gastric approach, then we're going to break those quadrants into really nine regions, right? So we have the right hypochondriac region, um, we have the left hypochondriac region and the epigastric region, which is named for the structure that lives in this region, which is going to be most of the esophagus or the stomach. We have the right lumbar region and left lumbar region, which really is named for the level at which it lives. And then the umbilical region, which houses the umbilicus or the belly button. And then we have the right iliac and left iliac region, which we know represents the level of the iliac crest. And then the hypogastric region means below the gastric region. And so that represents a portion of the uh, colon. And um, you can see, obviously, some of the small intestines as well. And the bladder um, lives in that region. So whichever approach you use, I would say be systematic with what that is. For me, it's going to be the quadrant approach, but certainly the region or gastric approach will work and is probably more thorough in nature. So now let's talk thorax pathologies, and then we'll finish up with abdominal pathologies um, for this lecture. So first pathology um, that is usually pretty, pretty scary for the patient, not necessarily for us, is going to be a solar plexus injury. So as we think about the solar plexus, it's one of the most common injuries to the uh, thorax slash abdominal region, it lives right in, in the sweet spot. So if we think about it, the solar plexus is like right where the central portion of the diaphragm is. That's the best way that I would say it. Essentially what happens is a patient takes a blow, a direct blow to the solar plexus, which is approximately right here. And they have this kind of momentary paralysis of the diaphragm, right? Which really what it means is it feels like the wind just got knocked out of them, right? That's a kind of a I don't know, a non-medical way to say that. I feel like I got the wind knocked out of me. Most often this occurs when patients take, take a blow to the anterior portion, but it certainly could happen um, if a patient takes a blow from behind. I mean, it would have to be a hard blow, but most often it's an anterior blow with like some type of helmet or an object. Where I've seen it the most is in, is in, in volleyball where an athlete goes to dive for a ball and lands directly on the ball, ball in a solar plex on the solar plexus. So what, hap what happens, as I said, is they get the wind knocked out of them. And so they have a really hard time kind of catching their breath because the diaphragm is spasming. Now, remember, when the diaphragm contracts, we know that the rib cage is going to expand and we're allowed to inhale. So if we have a hyper contraction, might be able to inhale, but we may not be able to get that breath out because of the spasming that's happening within the actual diaphragm. So they're going to have a hard time breathing. Your role as a clinician really truly is to help them control their breathing. So almost Lama's breathing with them, take a deep breath in with me, take a deep breath out. And as you're doing that, you're talking through them. You're saying, I know this is difficult. I know it feels like you can't get any air, but if you do this with me, I promise your breathing will restore itself. If that doesn't work, I've only had one severe case of a solar plexus injury. So I actually got in there and started kind of massaging um, the, the diaphragm a little bit in hopes that the spasm would relieve itself and we would restore normal breathing. So essentially for this pathology, you're really a Lamaze coach, right? Like you're teaching them how to breathe um, and, and restore that normative pattern, right? That's mainly your role. Most often it's not life-threatening. The only time I would say it's life-threatening is if they just can't catch their breath and they become cyanotic and maybe they pass out and you have to do rescue breathing. But again, that's a very rare, rare case. You're gonna see this a lot in court sports where balls are present. So basketball, your volleyballs, the obvious would be MMA, boxing would be another one, right? If you really want, like if you're boxing or doing MMA, if you give a direct blow to the solar plexus, most often the patient's going to drop, right? Because they, the diaphragm starts to spasm and they can't control their breathing. Next up are, we're going to talk about a series of pathologies that are all going to present the same and are all going to be treated the same. The first is a rib contusion. 
You can imagine the, the second is probably going to be either rib fracture or a costal chondral injury. I can't remember in which order, but the mechanism of injury for all three are the same. It's a blunt force trauma. It could either be to the lateral side of the rib cage, which you see here. It could be to the anterior side, at which point in time it's most often going to affect the true ribs. And it can be from the posterior aspect, right, which will most often affect the false and the floating ribs most, most often. So you can see that injury to the rib cage can occur from different angles and will impact different anatomical structures depending on what are the signs and symptoms, most often difficulty breathing, right? And the reason that they have difficulty breathing is because as they expand the rib cage, they're stretching the tissue and that in and of itself causes pain. So what are you? What do you think your objective findings are gonna be? Tenderness to palpation, obviously difficulty breathing and most often most patients to kind of avoid expanding the rib cage will splint to that side so they'll lean over to that side to reduce the amount of expansion within the rib cage so what are we going to do for them as clinicians if they walk into our clinic and they need help the one thing that i do is wrap the rib cage or compress it so that way it can't expand as much now if you wrap too tight right they're not going to be able to expand, which means they're not going to be able to get oxygen in. So you have to find kind of the, the good balance with wrapping and splinting. I've also seen in some clinical settings, clinicians will splint, will wrap the arm to the rib cage to create a splint that way. Can patients return to play with a rib contusion? Absolutely, as long as we've ruled out a rib fracture and made sure that a rib fracture isn't present. Um, and so we'll pad them to protect the area. And then again, we just want to limit activity until we've ruled out an actual fracture. So here is a rib fracture. The subjective and objective components are exactly the same as a rib contusion, which I mentioned. Well, if you suspect a fracture, most often in your objective findings, you're going to have a positive rib compression test, um, or the patient might report a sharp pain on one area of the rib cage. In that instance, you're going to refer out for an x-ray, and if it's fractured, then you're, you, you definitely want to refer because most often with a rib fracture, especially if it fractures posteriorly, then you're concerned about whether or not you've actually punctured a lung, and if air or um, blood is getting into the pleural cavity, that is a whole different set of pathologies, right, that we'll talk about. But for rib fractures in particular, about four to six weeks to heal themselves, we usually typically will splint the rib cage just so that the rib doesn't continue to get irritated and it can heal like it's supposed to. And then everything else is the same as a rib contusion. Now we have the bony part of the rib, right? That's most often fractured, but you can also have an injury to what we call is the costal chondral cartilage. That's the part of the rib cartilage part that connects the rib to the actual uh, sternum, right? So these little blue purple, spots right here. These are all what we call our costal chondral cartilage. Um, and so you can have a direct injury where, to where there's a disruption between the cartilage that attaches to the sternum and the sternum itself, right? And that's a little bit different than an actual fracture. It's a cartilage injury, right? Which may take a lot longer to heal itself because it doesn't get as much blood, right? The mechanism of the injury is the same. It's blunt, blunt force trauma. That blunt force trauma can certainly occur from a lateral blow to the rib cage, which causes a disruption of the articulation at the sternum, or it could be a direct anterior blow to the sternum, which causes this disruption at the costal chondral junction. Um, either way, the differential between a rib fracture and a costal chondral injury is the location of pain, right? The location of pain for costal chondral is going to be more anterior, right? You see that here, anterior medial. And then a rib fracture most often is going to be more lateral and maybe even posterior, depending on where that fracture is actually happening. Hard part is the objective is um, the objective findings are pretty much the same, right? Breathing is going to bother them. Um, they're going to be favoring the one side. The major differential is palpation. Where in the body does it actually hurt? We can also do rib compression tests too to rule out or rule in costal chondral injuries. So what do we do with these patients? Pretty much the same thing we do with the patient who has a fractured rib, right? We're going to compress with an ACE bandage. We're going to help them breathe or restore their breathing. And then we can pad and most often we can return the play. One thing that scares me about these injuries is it's the most anterior medial portion. It's the portion that's closest to the sternum. And we know that the sternum does what? Right, it protects the heart and a lot of the arteries or veins that live just posterior to that. And so a true anterior injury to the costal chondral, 
costochondral junction really makes me nervous that that sternum will become more mobile and won't be as protectionary as it was as if the costochondral cartilage was intact and in place. So just keep that in mind as you kind of work to return a patient to play with the costal chondral injury. Next up is thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, as you look at this image, and I recognize that not all of you have had anatomy, so I'm going to try my best to talk through this slowly, knowing that we all haven't had anatomy yet. So if we look at this image, remember I said the clavicle, I mean, it is a part of the thorax because it attaches medially to the manubrium, right? So we have this sternoclavicular joint. So we have the clavicle here. One of the reasons we also mentioned the clavicle is because just deep or inferior to the clavicle is the first rib. So you can see that here, right? But what we can also see in this image, um, imagine the neck being here, we can see the anterior scalene muscle, but we can see a set of neurovascular structures. We can see the brachial plexus. The brachial plexus is a series of nerve roots which emanate off of the cervical spine and travel into the upper arm and supply the, the shoulder, the elbow, and the hand, right? So we can see that this neural structure, these neural structures or nerves will pass through and underneath the clavicle and between the first rib, right? In addition to that, we have the subclavian artery and the subclavian vein, which are doing the same thing, right? That subclavian artery is passing just underneath the, the clavicle, but above the first rib, and so is that subclavian vein. So we have three neurovascular structures. We have the, the nerves of the cervical plexus or brachial plexus. We have the subclavian artery and we have the subclavian vein. And in a normal patient, this is great, right? The nerves have enough space to move through to their respective distal extremities. The artery has enough space to do what it's uh, expected to do, and so does the vein, right? But in some rare instances, we can have a patient who um, suffers from one of the disorders which impacts the thoracic outlet, right? If that makes sense. So how do we define thoracic outlet? Really what we're thinking of is kind of this space between the clavicle and the first rib, which houses these neurovascular structures, right? So most common type of thoracic outlet that we see uh, syndrome that we see is can be the scalenes being so tight that they compress upon the subclavian artery and or the nerves of the brachial plexus. That's one. We can also see an elevated first rib. So if the rib is elevated, there's less space for the vascular structures and neural structures to pass through. So it can compress if the rib is elevated, it can compress upon the neural structures and the vascular structures, right? Does that make sense so far? Sometimes we can see um, even more distal, the uh, pec minor can also be extremely tight or contracted and also compress on the neurovascular structure. So the nerves that are emanating off of the brachial plexus, the subclavian artery, or the subclavian vein, right? So as we think about this, we have to think, okay, there are three structures that can be um, compromise. Either it's a, a nerve or multiple nerves in the brachial plexus. It's the subclavian artery and or the subclavian vein, right? So the concern is if there's impingement to the subclavian artery, the hard part with that is kind of recognizing what the subclavian artery does, right? The subclavian artery, its major role is going to kind of, kind of be to carry oxygenated blood to kind of the, the the extremities, the upper extremities of the body, so the upper arm and the neck, and in some ways to the brain via the circle of Willis, right? Um, and then if it's the subclavian vein, then you have to say, okay, what's the role of the subclavian vein, right? Essentially what, what it does is it takes deoxygenated blood and, and brings it back to the heart where it can be oxygenated and then it can it then can travel through the subclavian artery back artery back to the upper extremities. So regardless of which of these uh, vascular structures becomes impinged, we still are concerned, right? Either if it's the artery, we're not getting enough oxygenated blood to the extremities. Um, if it's a vein, most often what we're really concerned with is the development of like a deep vein thrombosis, right? Or a blood clot that may get, get lodged and block blood flow back to the heart. And so either of those um, can be catastrophic. Uh, 
The most common though, take a deep breath, the most common form of thoracic outlet certainly is the one that plagues the neural structure, so the brachial plexus. So let's go to that objective part, right? Uh, where our patients most often with thoracic outlet syndrome will complain of that numbness and tingling um, or pain into the arm during overhead activities because you're stretching the brachial plexus. Um, in addition to that, if it's of a muscular kind of component, then they might have spasming, particularly in the kind of the anterior scalenes, which causes um, the neural signs and symptoms, or it could be spasming of the brachial plexus, which again would still cause neural signs and symptoms. Um, so what we will have to do ultimately our special test, right? And so what we're going to do um, is ruse test, Allen's, Adson's, and military brace. Each of these really look at a compromise of the of blood flow, right? In other words, one indirect way to assess um, blood flow um, is through uh, the intensity of the pulse, right? What we see in patients with thoracic outlet syndrome, in particular, those that have um, subclavian artery blocks as a result of either an elevated first rib or maybe a spasm scalene or pectoralis minor is that typically they will have a reduced radial um, artery palpable pulse when compared to the other side. So these tests help us kind of rule in or rule out thoracic outlet syndrome. One of the hard, with, one of the hard things with thoracic outlet syndrome is people just kind of shake it off, right? Oh, my hand's numb, no big deal. Oh, I slept on it wrong. And so they may go months until it's actually assessed. So anytime you have a patient who complains of numbness and tingling, you'll, you'll have to do an upper quarter screen is what we call that neurological, a full on neurological clinical assessment, just to make sure that it really truly isn't thoracic outlet syndrome. Now, what do we do for these patients, right? That's really the question. It's gonna depend on the anatomical structure causing the problems or the issues. If it's the first rib, they just remove the first rib. I don't mean to say it like it should be that easy, but literally it's a removal of the first rib, which would then create space for those neurovascular structures to live. And then if it's more muscular, then it depends, but most often it's gonna be some like type of instrumented soft tissue kind of massage to reduce the spasming, which is compressing the neurovascular structures. All in all, it's not catastrophic if we catch it early and we treat it early. Um, remember I talked about rib fractures, right? And I said, if we have a rib fracture, um, a sequela to a rib fracture can be air or blood getting into the pleural cavity. And so that is a pneumothorax, which is when air gets into the pleural cavity or a hemothorax, which is where blood actually gets into the pleural cavity. And so um, if we have either of these, these are both, these both can be life-threatening. So I just wanted to say that out loud. The mechanism of injury for a pneumothorax or hemothorax is blunt force trauma, most often to, to the thorax region, which is most often associated with a rib fracturing um, and maybe puncturing the pleural cavity and allowing air and or blood to get into the space. Now, oftentimes as air or blood is allowed to fill the space, one of the things that you'll see is a tracheal deviation. So you can see the trachea starts to, to deviate or shift or change its position. So that's one visual thing that you all can do. If you notice after a blow to the rib cage that you start to see tracheal deviation, or in, in this case, if a patient has a pneumo versus a hemo, if you have them cough and you see blood on their hand, that's hemothorax, those are medical emergencies because what happens over time is as air or blood is allowed to continue to drive into the, the the plural space, what you'll start to see is what happens on this side. You got it. The lung starts to shrink, right? To make way for the air or the fluid that needs to sit in that cavity. So those patients are gonna kind of report chest, deep chest pain. So you may even be thinking heart attack possibly, shortness of breath, they'll have an increase in their heart rate, right? Cause the body's trying to work harder. And so this is a medical emergency. I've had this happen twice. I've had a pneumothorax happen twice in my life. Um, and both times what they do is they go in through their two ribs, they um, split them, and then they put in a vacuum. And so that vacuum slowly removes the air or slowly removes the fluid. But again, medical emergency, if after, after a fracture, your patient is spitting up blood, um, or if after a fracture, you know a, a tracheal deviation. Now, there is this thing called sudden death syndrome, and um, we are, you all are, have been blessed enough to kind of see this play out in the NFL. I'm assuming all of you at some point in time have seen the Damar Hamelin 
um, film where he collapsed instantaneously on the field and no one knows what happened exactly. My guess is it was commotio cortis. It didn't end in death for him, but commotio cortis is where you take a blow to the anterior part of the sternum. So the sternal body, and it has to be literally right at the a specific time. So you take a direct blow to the anterior sternum of the chest and that causes the heart um, to go into fibrillation. The patient will immediately collapse as we saw in the DeMar Hamelin case. And um, if you don't begin um, CPR efforts or AED efforts right away, then the patient typically will um, pass away instantaneous, which is why we call that sudden death syndrome. So the big things, things that were done well for DeMar Hamelin is their certified athletic trainer, I'm saying that proud, um, reacted immediately and instantaneously and started CPR. And then of course, eventually I'm assuming they, they got the AED. By that time, everyone had crowded around so we couldn't see the treatment. But it was one of the best treatments that I've seen in an emergent situation. You can tell that athletic trainer probably had practiced multiple times. So having an emergency action plan in place is going to be extremely important. And then for most NFL and NCAA Division I athletes, everyone has to get an EKG to rule out um, pre-existing heart conditions like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which essentially is an enlarged or a, th a thickened ventricular septum, which means that our left ventricle can't fill with as much blood, which means there just isn't as much blood to pump out to the rest of the body. So they're already living in somewhat of a deficit. So if this happens to you, patient takes a blow to the chest and immediately collapses, the first thing you should want to do is drop to your knees and start compressing in the center of the chest, if nothing else. Um, so Hank Gathers is an example of sudden death syndrome. I'll show that in class, but sudden death syndrome, it does happen. You can have an athlete on the court running down the court one minute who collapses and you're just, you're big job and big role as a healthcare practitioner is really just to treat that athlete right in that moment and then let the other healthcare practitioners come alongside you and, and help you. Now we're moving into abdominal pathologies and there really aren't that many that you have to be concerned with, but of the ones that do happen, certainly they're yeah, it is, they can be life-threatening. So our first one is a liver contusion. Remember, if we look at the four quadrants um, of the abdominal cavity, we know that most of the liver, at least its right lobe, is going to live in the upper right-hand quadrant. And then the small portion of that, mostly the left lobe, will live in the upper left-hand quadrant. So most of your palpation for liver is going to occur in that upper right-hand quadrant. What, how does it happen? A patient takes a blow to the upper right-hand quadrant. Most often it's a helmet. So we see this most often in, in, the, in football. Um, and so it, with the contusion, if the liver becomes lacerated, they may internally bleed. And if they're internally bleeding, that starts to place uh, pressure on the visceral cavity. As a result, they may go into shock. They, if, if, if it presses or compresses on the phrenic nerve, for example, or the vagus nerve, they may vomit. Um, but what we typically see and why it's important to be able to palpate those four quadrants systematically is they'll have abdominal rigidity, right? That abdomen where it should be soft will most often be hard because it's feeling with blood from the, the laceration or from the contusion. So in terms of what we do as healthcare practitioners, um, we ask history questions. So they take a blow to the abdomen. Do you have any pain in your right scapula? Remember, I think I talked about this referred pain. Most often with internal injuries, they're going to have referred pain elsewhere. For the liver, that referred pain is to the right shoulder. To For the spleen, it's to the upper left-hand shoulder, and we call that Kerr's sign. And we're going to palpate that upper right-hand quadrant, and most often they're going to be tender to palpation. Next and most common in your age group is going to be appendicitis. The mechanism is unknown, quite honestly. The appendix serves very little function. Most of its function is protectionary. Um, in other words, it's like white blood cells. It really helps to fight against, uh, I'm sorry, white blood cells. It helps to fight against infection in the body. But other than that, we can, we can live without it. So uh, it, most often an itis is an inflammatory condition. So we, what I'm gonna say to you is an appendicitis will come on acutely. Most often it's due to some sort of infection, maybe even a bowel obstruction, which places pr um, pressure on the appendix and causes it to enlarge. Your patient is going to report significant amount of pain in the lower right quadrant of their abdominal cavity. And so we use McBurney's point um, to test. 
So you're going to find the ASIS and the umbilicus, and you're going to go about halfway in between there and press down. The patient will not have pain on the downward motion, but as you remove your hand from the downward pressure, they will complain of pain. That would be a positive McBurney's point, and you should refer that out or cart them to the ER. They're going into surgery. Next is a ruptured spleen. The mechanism of injury is very similar. It's going to be trauma or direct blow to the upper left-hand quadrant. The great thing about the spleen is you can see the stomach kind of sits um, superficial to it or on top of it. So the stomach will absorb most of the blow um, or the forces and then the spleen will take it. The spleen most often will become ruptured with a direct blow, um, a really hard driving force, most often a helmet. And so we see this often in patients who've had mono, who have had enlarged spleens and who compete, which is why it's important to not allow a patient to compete to compete when they have mono because the spleen is already enlarged, so they're at a higher risk for um, spleen rupture. But if it's the case that the spleen does rupture or becomes lacerated, the same signs and symptoms that exist for the liver will exist for the spleen. So they're probably going to shock, most often nauseousness and vomiting, and they will most likely have abdominal rigidity in the upper left-hand quadrant. They will have referred pain to the upper left shoulder, also known as um, Kerr's sign. So you're going to do your palpations of the four quadrants to rule in or rule out a spleen rupture. Next are the kidneys. And remember, we talked about those kind of free floating ribs, and we can see how they play a major role kind of in protecting the, the kidneys. So usually it's blunt force trauma to the back. Um, so when a patient gets wrapped from the back, it's a running back and they're tackling him or her from the back. Most often that's how the kidneys get, get injured. Um, the patient may be in shock, but what we'll really see uh, with the kidneys um, is because there are filters of urine, oftentimes if there is a laceration or a contusion to the kidneys, most often you'll see blood um, in the urine. You may have to do like a urine dipstick test in the field, which because obviously blood in the urine can certainly be traced. So objective, they'll have localized pain most often in the posterior region. And sometimes we'll kind of mistake that as like lower back pain or maybe rib pain and not really think about the kidneys, which kind of live more posterior than they do anteriorly. So biggest objective assessment is localized uh, pain in the region posteriorly where the kidneys might be. So make sure if you have pain posteriorly, maybe you have blood in the urine, refer out just to make sure that you get an x-ray. And that's all I have for you all. Um, I hope that you learned a lot about the thorax and how important it is um, in protecting most of our vital organs. The abdominal cavity houses a lot of our internal organs, so it's extremely important too. I look forward to seeing you all in class.